In terms of course topics, we'll look at introduction and applications of switchgear, circuit breaker design, switchgear specifications, and operational safety. Those are the four topics. This recording will be concentrating on the first topic, which is introduction and applications of switchgear. We'll cover the other three topics here in subsequent recordings. So today we'll look at introduction and applications of switchgear. Content for this topic is typical electrical networks, circuit breakers and switchgear, and forms of high voltage switchgear. We'll start off with a single line diagram and so on. We'll look at different types of circuit breakers and switchgear and then we'll look at high voltage switchgear. So starting off with single line diagrams, a typical example is listed in the next slide for a high voltage distribution network. And why do you call it single line diagram? The reason is because you represent three phases using a single line representation. Everything is simplified, shown as a single line. So to cover an example, this is a typical single line diagram. What you will find here, and some of you might have seen single line diagrams before, uh, what you will find here is rather than show the three phases, you show the circuit has a single phase representation. In this scheme here, you have two circuits, all right, 13.8 kV starting at the top. And what you have there, the first device is your fuse and potential transformer, a voltage transformer. Under that, you have your current transformer core, overcurrent and earth fault relays. You have your circuit breaker underneath. You have your power transformer. Um, you have your CT again, your circuit breaker, and then you have your bus section. So you have two incomers. You have a bus coupler in between. The rating of the bus coupler is 1200 amps. You have a number of loads. Some of them are transformer feeders. Some are motor feeders. So. You have different devices, different equipment, everything shown in a simple format. If I was to point at some, that there would be your fuse and potential transformer. This here would be your current transformer. That would be your circuit breaker. That would be your distribution transformer, your step down transformer. That's your CT as well, current transformer again, circuit breaker. That's your outgoing loads. And this here is your bus coupler. In terms of active and passive components, now every circuit, every system has two components, active components and passive components. Active components are components that are continuously in use. They are on all the time. So once they are energized, they are carrying current all the time. Transformers, cables, overhead lines and metering equipment. Passive components, on the other hand, function only when you require them to. For example, circuit breakers, you switch them on. If there is a fault, they trip. Isolators, you operate them at certain times. Links, you want to open the system. Earth switches, you want to earth the line. So passive components are operational only when required. In terms of circuit breaker utilization, you do not want to install more switch gear than absolutely required. If you install additional equipment, if it's not required, you're only contributing to the cost. It makes it more expensive. So you don't want any more functionality than what you require. In terms of uh, most common forms of medium voltage switch gear, you have automatic circuit breakers and non-automatic load breaking fault making switches. Now with circuit breakers, they are automatic, they sense the fault, trip. With switches, however, they are manually operated, so they are switches. They don't have a relay. They have the capacity to break on load, but you are physically operating them, physically switching them. In terms of circuit breaker, the main function of a breaker is to automatically interrupt fault current, but it can close onto a fault and thereby should be able to make onto fault current. So if you look at a circuit breaker, you might wonder why it should be capable of making onto a fault. It should be capable of interrupting fault current for obvious reasons. It wants to trip in case of a fault. But what will happen is you might assume the fault is cleared and you turn on the breaker. 
but the fault might still be present. In that situation, if the breaker is not rated to withstand or close onto a fault, it might get damaged. So a breaker should have the capacity to close onto a fault also. Benefits of using this arrangement, you can only isolate the faulty section, you can leave the healthy section intact. Otherwise, if you didn't have a provision for isolating only the faulty section, what would happen? You would turn off the entire system. In terms of medium voltage switchgear, you have non-automatic load breaking, fault making switches. Now some of you might have seen ring main units. Now if you do a keyword search on Google, you will find a lot of things in there. You will find ABB and Schneider units, different brands, uh, ring main units, which give you uh, the switching capacity, ring main circuits. So they are non-automatic load breaking, fault making switches connected together in a switchboard arrangement. And sometimes they are combined with transformers and low voltage switch gear to form compact substations. If you look at urban areas, you might see ground mounted transformers inside a cabinet that will have HV side, your 11 or 22 kV. It will have a transformer and it will have a low voltage switch gear. And those are compact substations. On the high voltage end, you have your ring main unit. For ring main units, if you do have a transformer, if the switch has to feed a transformer, then you can't just rely on the switch for protection, you might have a fuse. So internally you have a fuse and that fuse acts as a protection mechanism for the transformer. So this is a cross section where you have your tripping mechanism, your T-off bushing and uh, moving contact spring. The benefit of this fuse is it gives you three phase tripping. So if there is an overload on one of the phases, when that fuse blows, the tripping mechanism here trips the other two phases, so all three phases open. So it prevents single phasing. When one phase blows, all three phases open. So that's a benefit of having this fuse switch. So while you might have for incoming cables just a manually operated switch, for transformer you have a manually operated switch, but you might have fuse protection for it because you want to protect the transformer. Now this shows you a picture of a ring main unit. So ring, this is the ABB ring main unit. What you will see here is your SF6 gauge. All right. Now this is your ring switch. That is your ring switch. And this is, as you can see with the symbol, earth switch. Now you would have interlocks, mechanical interlocks. So when the ring switch is closed, you cannot apply your earth switch. Here you can see clearly the ring switch is open. So the earth switch can be applied. So these are manually operated. You insert a handle there or handle there, same there. But this is used for transformer supply. So you have fuses here. So this is also a manually operated switch. The only difference between that and these two switches is this switch, if there is a fault, trips automatically while this does not. But in terms of closing, all of them have to be closed manually. So these units allow the network to be sectionalized to locate where the fault is. So they have to be capable of making onto a fault. Over 80% of all switching operations are likely to be caused by repair or maintenance requirements on other network switch gear or lines. 